Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy, where we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and apply it to the questions you deal with every day. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. I'm Anastasia here with Mike and John, and this week we are discussing the aimless justified murder of lots of people the aimless justified murder of lot so we're talking about hitler so wait, when you say aimless Kidding. do you mean like literally or with sometimes. without purpose sometimes uh without uh, sometimes literally poor aim they're, they're, uh, sometimes they're just not aiming they're just pulling yeah. the trigger yeah sometimes just not really giving a shit if you're Hollywood going to the right style. house so uh, um, but no we're talking about police militarization police militarization i was wondering when we were actually going to get to the topic because i was i'm all ready for a, for a hitler when Again, if, if you know we needed it. Oh, yeah. But before we get started, what are we drinking, guys? We are drinking Oceans Between Us. From the Great Raft Brewing Company in Shreveport, Louisiana. Oh, this, a good is a, this is a what? Six point? Seven. Seven point. Wow. Um, ought to be interesting. Um, did we have to take out a second mortgage on the house to buy this particular uh, beer? I don't know. It was Close. cheap. It was only $8 a bottle. $8 a bottle. Is that a 12-ounce bottle? Uh, I'd have to check. It looks like it. Yes. <laughs> That's a pretty beer. It is. Hold up. I'm checking the ounces. Darker the ounces. So you wanna... while, uh, while he is doing that, uh, this is an interesting good. topic to be talking about. Uh, it is 25 ounces. Okay. So it's bigger than it looks. It is it now? Okay. <laughs> it's bigger than it looks. If I had a dime for every time I've heard that in my life. Oh, You Lord. would have none? I would have nothing. It's actually smaller than it looks. It's I thought... a drinker, not a shower. Uh, <laughs> So what made you want to do this show, John? Well, so uh, there's a couple things. One, uh, we we kind of talked about going back and revisiting ah. some of the early shows we did. You got a port right. Um, <laughs> revisiting some of the early shows we did. And uh, we recently did a show on civil asset forfeiture. And this seemed to, to lead in really well to that, as it did before. Um, and it's it's a topic we haven't looked at it in a little while, but yeah. it does. It's another one that doesn't seem to have changed much. And yeah, I think we visited it. Uh, I don't know if we actually did a whole show on it, but we've 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 talked around it on some episodes. Oh no, I'm pretty earlier. sure it was it was one of the very was early it, shows. Was we it? Did. Yeah. I can't remember. That was so long ago, and you know I've slept since then. Not much, but I've slept since then. All right, so I guess you know just to dive right Thank in, you. I, I want to start off with a little bit of the, uh, of the history of police militarization and and where this came from uh the act really took off in the 1960s following the vietnam vietnam and the war on drugs is it vietnam or vietnam i don't know anyway vietnam and the war on drugs um (coughs) these uh, two organizations one you probably heard more than the other but they're, they're both you know more or less two words for the same thing SWAT and PPU is an outgrowth of, of this, this change. Uh, SWAT stands for Special Weapons and Tactics, and uh, PPU stands for Police uh, Paramilitary. Unit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Police Paramilitary S- Unit. SWAT started in L.A., right? Yes. I do believe yeah, so, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. During the Watts riot, or right after the Watts riots. Yeah, yeah during the civil rights, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and it, it's interesting because this is one of the few, you know, changes in our country um, of, of this time where we can actually point to the specific people who did it. Uh, two Partially because it's so recent. Yeah. Two gentlemen, uh, Daryl Gates and John Nelson, uh, started SWAT. John was part of an elite force recon unit. Uh, which Hoorah. While, yeah. While they were called uh, force recon, uh, they actually uh, were uh, a highly effective unit that were very much I- about engaging the enemy. In fact, in enemy encounters, they engaged 90% of the time and were very successful in their encounters. Yeah, uh, the, the Force Recon is the elite of the Marine Corps. Yeah. 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 Um, so John returns and joins the LAPD and gets involved in the... W- Hold, quick question. Do you have any idea what the normal rate of engagement would be with a unit like that? Uh, I, I don't I don't know. It's, okay. a, it's a different kind of... I would of, imagine it would depend a, on what situation yeah, you're well, in. Yeah, it, well, it, it's a different kind of unit. The uh, Force Recon is a group that's not attached directly to a, a, a battalion. It's, mm-hmm. it's a unit that's that they send in, in extremely special situations. Right. Uh, they, they're kind of attached whenever you deploy out there. Uh, they're the first in, usually. Oh, okay. Yeah. So would you expect that they would have a higher than normal engagement unit I, for other I, reconnaissance I would units? expect that they would uh, just because of what their mission is. They're, okay. they're, they tend to go in whenever there's something that's being that's already planned. Okay. They're going to come in. They're going to create the chaos that's going to allow 
the rest to come through. Cool. So I, I wanted to get a little background yeah, there. Yeah. For okay. Me. Hey, not, not a problem. And I'll tell you, they are some bad motherfuckers. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I, I uh, um, actually did the, uh, the tryout when I was in School of Infantry for, for Battalion Recon, which is like the baby version of Force Recon. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it, and that that motherfucker killed me. So uh, I, I wasn't ready for that. So oh. uh, these guys are tough. They're, okay, they're some bad guys. Nice. So uh, John returns and joins the LAPD, and he gets involved in the Watts riots, which, for anyone who doesn't know, were racially motivated riots. Yeah. Um, uh, Watts due to the racial suburb tension. of LA. Yeah, which which is interesting because later we're going to see where the story picks up is again. Due to racial tension. So, um, but the watch right, and he, he goes to his boss, Daryl Gates, uh, and he sees how these riots are going, and he, he remembers his military training, and he said, you know, we could handle these riots so much more effectively. Uh, so he wants to discuss with him modeling the unit after Force Recon. Um, and after some discussion, they agreed to form what was originally going to be called, check this out, the Special Weapons and Attack Team. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. La- later, they they determine that that attack is is not politically correct enough, so they they downgrade it to special weapons and tactics. Um, and so so that's kind of the history there. And and after they started, you know, uh, other police force start picking up. Um, yeah, and, they, and, and and we're talking they. Uh, this is a group of men that modeled themselves so strongly that their their uniforms were different. Their mm-hmm. weapons were different. They were using they were using military strategies. Yeah, they're not using they're not wearing the traditional blue police <laughs> uniforms. They're yeah. wearing camo and and all this, and they're not carrying the same equipment. Yeah, um, yeah. they're using assault rifles. Yeah. Mm-hmm. for the most part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's their like go to. Yeah. So, you know, I want to start this off. I mean, it's it's right there in the name, police militarization. It's modeled after our military. Uh, and, and as we'll see, a lot of this is due to a program where the military hands down equipment to local law enforcement, yeah. including ridiculous things like an anti-mine uh, 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 armored vehicle. Yeah. Because of all the mines laying around in L.A., you know. Yeah. Um, well, they're, 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 let's, let's be fair that while there weren't mines, there were... Uh, you know, they were firebombing places, and and this is something that would protect you from that. Mm-hmm. But an armored personnel carrier will protect you from that too. Right. You, you, right. You don't you don't need a tank. Yeah. Uh, and and some of this, I know I know you guys are going. It's not a tank. No, I know it's not a tank like the military style. But the image that we get of a tank, that's what it is. But when a civilian sees that on their street, yeah, yeah, it it is more reminiscent of a tank yeah. than it is of a any paddy other. Wagon. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, I want to start off, uh, uh, you know, a big word that gets thrown around, and, and maybe you can start by explaining what this means in the history of it, um, but how does this relate to, and does it violate posse comitatus? Does it violate posse comitatus? I don't think so, because it's still got local control. It's not something... The reason posse comitatus is a situation is because of the command and control structure of the military. Mm-hmm. You can't come through and you can't put a military command over... Uh, mm-hmm. Over a civilian population, it's it, it's illegal. Now we did it after d- during Reconstruction, mm-hmm. but but it was it was uh, in a time period when the Southern states had had seceded and they weren't yet readmitted to the Union, and, and you know there was it's, it's well, and I found situations. that to be really interesting. Um, but, 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 but before we get get into argument here, do, does anyone want to talk about what posse comitatus is for any for for our listeners? Yeah, uh, po- posse comitatus, and I don't ha- I don't I don't have the Latin uh, down to, to know what it means. You might look it up uh, real quick. I, I I have forgotten it. Force of the people. Force of the people. Uh, it's it's just the basic belief that the military can't be used uh, inside the borders of the United States yeah. against the civilian population. Yeah. Now they can be used in a in, in a in a military invasion. They can be used in time of war, but they can't be used as a police force yeah. against the uh, um, uh, against the civilian population. That's where the word posse comes from. And and. And I believe you were looking up, and, and you found a few exceptions to this, which I think are really interesting to this discussion. You want to go into those? Um, so there was there were the Enforcement Acts and the Insurrection Act. Um, the Enforcement Act allows the president to send in military when state authorities are unwilling or unable to suppress violence that is in opposition to the constitutional rights of the people. Think of Katrina. Right. Um, and or then what, what was the, the ones where they were integrating black people into white schools? Oh, yeah, Little Rock. Little uh, Rock, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and that's what's interesting here. And is, that was different. That was the state guard. That was a little different. So, okay. So, yeah. and, and there are exceptions. Um, a 
the state guard and the state air national guard. Yeah, the state military. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. And the, the coast guard. Yeah. The state military um, and the coast guard are not covered under posse comitatus. Um, so long as they are, and this is specific to the state military, are acting within that uh, their their own state. Yeah. Now, you know, if you know a little bit about your history, the reason why we have this rule, and I'm getting back to what I was talking about mm -hmm. earlier, is is Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. You know, when the when the South lost the Civil War, one of the things they did is they divided the, the South into five military districts, and they put a general over all these and, and, and declared martial law over them, mm -hmm. and. It was going. It was going to be a bunch of Southern uh, legislators that, after Reconstruction was complete and and, and they regained the uh, the right to vote, and all, they're the ones that are going to push through these 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 regulations because they didn't want to have those kind of abuses done again. Because honestly, the abuses that were done under uh, under martial law during Reconstruction, while a little more justified, I think, than than than, than the, the Revolutionary era era period were not much different than the same injustices that were done by the Crown in the American mm -hmm. Revolution. Uh, so there, there's a reason for this. There's yeah. a reason for these laws. Mm -hmm. well, well, let me ask you this. Um, from a posse comitata standpoint, and while it, it is completely true that um, the state's militaries can go in and, and various other exceptions, and while it's not explicitly stated, I think we can say the police because it, it, yeah. it, it, it's a domestic unit. Um, is it okay... No matter who the recipient is, for the U.S. military to say, ah, Posse Comitatus, we can't go in there. Hey, you guys over there, what if we gave you all our guns and equipment and then trained you and you went in instead? Well, I think that's what's happened. I think that that's exactly what, what has happened is, is we've got this revolving door. Mm -hmm where people are coming out of the military, they're going into the police, and a lot of times they're not even serving as, uh, as, as, as regular police officers. They're going in as this militarized wing of the mm -hmm. police force. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, not, go ahead. And, 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 and I'm not even going to be one to say that, that there's never a spot for that. I think there is a spot for it. I think it's, it, it's, it's abused a lot, but I think there is a spot for that. I was awful glad when the, the gunman in, in, uh, in Dallas, uh, about, was it last year? Uh, it was a couple it, years yeah, back now. not that long, in Dallas. I was awful glad there was a SWAT team there for that situation. Um, I, I, you know, uh, in, in Las Vegas, whenever the, there was the shooter, I was kind of glad that there was something there for that. But there's, again, there's a, there's a time for this. Um, the, 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 you know, the, the SWAT team being called in on, on three rednecks at a meth lab is not, is, to me, it's not the, the time for it. So, so, but I guess, let me ask you this. What is the important part of, com of Posse Comitatus? Is it the idea that the, the, the military, which is paid for by the citizens of the United States and raised for their own defense, uh, cannot use that, that funding and, and, and that, that, that great military power they've, they've gained through that against the people or is it that we don't care how the 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 money trickles back down and 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 whether or not this 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 funding and this machine is used against people it's who's using it like which is no, the you, no i think well, I, I i i personally think uh and, and i don't think there's a there's a, there's a black and white on this right, okay right, it's right. definitely gray areas but in my opinion the importance of posse comitatus is about command and control uh, as a historian, I look at it, and and one of the ways that 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 republics fall over and over again is 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 through military coup, mm -hmm. and it's there to prevent that from happening. Okay. And we've seen it all over the world. That's what Manuel Noriega was in Panama. That's what F uh, uh, Ferdinand Marcos was in the Philippines. You know, all over the world, this is what happens: is when the military is used uh, as as a police force, that military then begins to abuse its power, and we end up with a military dictatorship. We end up with a banana republic, and that's what the fear was. And the founders were keenly aware of that. They were keenly aware of, of, of the fact that um, this is how all republics had always fallen. Washington was the exception. Uh, I've talked about a book before in, in here called Anatomy of a Revolution by Crane Britain. Uh, if anybody's a real history buff, go read Anatomy of a Revolution by Crane Britain, where he analyzes all the great revolutions. And with the exception of the U.S. Revolution, they all ended with a military dictatorship. Napoleon, uh, you know, you go to the Russian Revolution, you go to, to Oliver Cromwell in England. They all end with a with this, and that's what Posse Comitatus is aimed at, in my opinion. Okay. Yeah. 
Anna? Well, whenever you you look at the situation in which Posse Comitatus came about, um, a lot of it had to do with the election between Hayes and... Tilden. That guy. Um, and Yeah, the Compromise of 1876. Yeah, exactly. And so a, a big part of that was this compromise that there would be some sort of... Um, Solution so that we didn't see the military being used um, on citizens within our own borders. And I think that um, what Posse Comitatus uh, culturally was intended to do was um, to prevent the military from being used to take power from your uh, local law enforcement authorities, sort of a federalism yeah. um, idea. But there is an essentially an elastic clause within the Insurrection Acts. Um, you know, one of the things that I mentioned was... We always have to put a build a guilt, get out of jail free card in. Well, there was already the loophole of, well, the military can be sent in to... Um, the, the president can order the military sent in to restore law and order yeah. when there is violence happening that either the local authorities are unable, unwilling, or are failing to suppress. Um, but that was, it was specific to when people's human and constitutional rights That's are being right. violated. That's right. But then there's this, this really little section at the end, at, at the very end of it, it's like two lines that is essentially the elastic clause of all of this. That says, well, I mean, unless there are other things that maybe aren't covered here that the president thinks is uh, okay to send the military in for. And while I don't think that, I don't think they're using that here, but I think that kind of shifted the thinking in such a way that it, it made it possible for us to switch that to say, well, I mean, we're not sending in the military, but... We can make the police forces um, armed well enough and and change their culture in such a way that I mean, what's the difference? Yeah, I, I, I don't I don't see it that way. Um, and, and the largest reason I don't see it that way is because our founders designed a program where the commander in chief was a civilian that was in charge of it. So you're not it, it's not we're going to put the military in charge. It's it's it, this civilian can say. We need it in this case. Mm -hmm. That's something different to me. I, I, I mean, e even there, I think there's problems with mm -hmm. it, but that's 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 built into our system. We intentionally put a civilian in charge of that for that reason. Mm -hmm. So, I got two more points I want to hit on. I think there's a there's a great place here to to talk about this beer. Um, next thing I want to talk about, uh, and and this has been an ongoing point of debate in this whole thing. Is what is the job of a of a Leo, a law enforcement officer? Yeah. And and you, you you hear kind of these these two dialogues, one of this very hardline conservative, you know, enforce the law, I don't care what the law is, yep. you know, what whatever, at any cost, that's their job. And then you hear this idea uh coming more from the left, um, about a peace officer. Yeah. And and their job is to de escalate things and, and create a, a peaceful environment for citizens to live. So so where do you kind of fall on that spectrum? I was uh, you, I I didn't know we were going to go this direction, but I was reminded of a story when I was in the Marine Corps. We were uh, we were getting ready to go into Puerto Rico, and we didn't go. There was a there was there was uh, they were sending us in for peacekeeping at the last minute. We didn't go, and my first sergeant was so glad we didn't go, and I asked him why. He, first sergeant got the Congressional Medal of Honor in Vietnam. He's a great man, uh, and and he looked at me and he said, um, he said Marines don't make good police officers. I said, well, what do you mean? We're you know we're trained in this stuff. And this is the quote I'll never never forget. He said, police officers' jobs are to protect lives and property. Marines' jobs are to blow shit up and kill people. Yeah. The two, peop the, the, the two philosophies don't go together. No, they don't. And I've always, that's always stuck in my <laughs> mind, uh, you know, that, that you know, we, don't make good, we don't make good cops for that yeah. reason. I'm not going to say they can't make a good cop later. Right. But while you're serving in that position, you're not a good cop. So does the opposite hold true that cops don't make good uh, uh, special weapons and tactics people? I don't know. Uh, I, 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 would, I would think so. But again, remember— I think it we, depends on how those teams are being used. But, but we've changed. We've changed the, the model because, again, a lot of these guys are never serving a day in the blue uniform. They're coming out of yeah. the military. They're going in because they are— they're good at, break, at at door breaking. They're good at, mm -hmm. at they're good at killing. 
But I think this goes back to my previous question, because if we're going to say they never served a day in the blue uniform, they were brought in from the military, they came yeah. in and got plugged into this position, yeah. I think we have to ask really interesting questions about Posse Comitatus. Yes, they're being paid by this group instead of this group, but that's what they've done. There, that's who yeah, but, they are. But you, the decision, you know but the decisions are still being made by the civilians. Yeah. Okay. But when, well, and I guess you did make that argument earlier that yeah. the decisions are being made by the civilians, regardless, because the head of the military is civilian. Well, the, the head of yeah, the commander in chief is. But, but they're being but, made but, by the local authority, yeah. not the federal well, authority. It, but but even then, even then, if you've got a situation where. You put command in the field, and the military is doing it. There's something different now. Now decisions are being made by the military, by by the federal branch. There's a, there's a difference that happens there. The command comes from here, but now we've got something else happening. Okay. Um, uh, I really don't know where I come on, where I fall on this. I'm 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 feeling my way through as we go mm-hmm. through this, and just kind of trying to. When you hear something, I'm responding with yeah. what I'm feeling at the moment. I I'm, I'm I may be I don't know where I am. W- what are your thoughts on, on the job of Leo? Um. I- I think that it is to, um, fuck it, I don't know. To fuck Protect it. and defend. <laughs> yeah, and defend. I mean, I'm, in, I'm inclined to say that I think the job of law enforcement is um, to protect the people within their jurisdiction. Um, now. That's a good, good, good little part to put in there, within their jurisdiction. Now, um, that is going to mean... And enforcing the laws on the books. Um, I think there is a, a part that is separate from that, though, where as a human, there may be some laws on the books that you shouldn't be enforcing. Um, but I do think that you have to separate who you are as a human from the job of a law enforcement officer, because I think who you are as a human doesn't change no matter what job you have. I well, think that's why I wouldn't be a good cop is because I think their job is to enforce the law as written regardless. And as a person, there are some laws I disagree with and it wouldn't make me a good cop. Well, and, and well, but if there were laws, okay, you're saying that the job is to enforce the law yeah. and, and you wouldn't be a good cop. I wouldn't be a good because, cop because okay. there are certain laws that I no, think are okay. unjust and I would have a hard time enforcing them. Yeah, absolutely. But, but I, I don't think enforcing them makes you a bad person. That's your job. I, I, I don't think there's any argument that both of these are involved in the job. I think what we're really having a conversation here about is, is priority. So you have a law that says it is illegal to spit on the sidewalk. You also know that having a hardline engagement on spitting on the sidewalk could result in the loss of life. So what's your priority? Is it to make sure that nobody spits on the sidewalk yeah. or to make sure that people don't die? Yeah. And, and, and you know when you're making your decisions about what you do next, those priorities, though, though uh, uh, th- there are a few situations that they come into play in, it's really important in those situations. Yeah, well, don't, don't disengage for, from, the, from the manhunt for the child molester to deal with the spitting on the sidewalk. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and there's nuance there that I think is absolutely necessary for, um, for law enforcement that is engaging with, um, with the people generally. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is if their job is to protect and serve – um, protect being the primary function there. You have to make judgment calls about when to de-escalate a situation versus when to escalate a situation because, and, and this is one of the things that we've seen in recent years in uh, communities where certain maybe neighborhoods or groups of people are being targeted relentlessly is that um that culture of escalating and escalating and targeting specific people is actually resulting in a more dangerous, uh, a, a more dangerous environment. And so I, I think you have yeah. to incorporate that nuance to say what is going to not just in this particular situation, but what is, uh, what are my actions going to do to contribute to the overall safety of this community? You know, I've, I've I didn't realize until now, but I have a problem with protect and serve. I don't have a problem with protect and defend. But if if, if your job is to protect and and serve, Mm -hmm. you are, to me, at this point, you are, um, I don't know. 
responsible to the will of, of, of the people as it changes very quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's not what it is. You're not responsible to the will. You're responsible to the law. And sometimes the law and the will aren't the same thing. Yeah. The will can become the law. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I, I didn't. I never realized I would have a problem with that statement until you started saying that, and, and you said protect and serve, and I'm going no, yeah, no, because there's 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 a lot of people out there that I don't need to be serving. Uh, they're, they're they're committing crimes, or the state doesn't need to be. The serving. state doesn't need to be serving. Yeah. Well, but I think that's the overall idea with with protect and serve. I don't think it has anything to do with the idea of serving the criminals. I think it it is supposed to be geared towards serving your community. I think it is, I think it's supposed to too, but community. I just I think it's supposed to too, but just hearing that in my mind, that's mm -hmm. what went through my mind. That's yeah. why I think I like protect and defend better. Okay. Fair right. enough. Uh, the last one I want to talk about before we get to the beer is uh something I'm calling frontline syndrome, but you've you've heard it before mm -hmm. in, in many different things. The war on X, the war on drugs, yeah, yeah. the war on oh. terror. And you know, I think I think this is a really interesting way in which it, it hasn't directly um, been the cause of police militarization, but it's fed into the culture. It mm has -hmm. it has justified police militarization. Um, and and whenever you you go into something and you think I'm in a war on, we'll use drugs for an You're example. You're in a war on a, in a war on an idea instead yeah. of a war on an enemy. All of a sudden, these people that use drugs, these drug dealers, are no longer citizens of your community. No, they're combatants. They're the enemy in a war. Yeah. And and at that point, you know, I, I I don't know if there's a term for it, but we've kind of gone the complete opposite way of Posse Comitatus. And instead of not using the military against the people, we have taken the, the people's you protect and people defend. people not exist. Well, we've taken the people's force who is, whose job it is to protect and defend and made them uh, frontline combatants in a war. Yeah. You, yeah, in which everybody that they engage with on a daily basis is either an enemy or a potential enemy. Do, do you believe that that whole mentality? I, I know you were. I don't think you were deployed. Correct me if I'm wrong. Into a war, um, uh, but a couple of things, but the, not declared wars. Yeah. yeah. So, so the way that that military combatants act when they are deployed uh, into yeah. a, a hostile territory. Do you think that that's a, a healthy way for our police forces no, to, to behave? No, there's nothing healthy about it. Uh, that you 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 get a mentality of us against them, and it, uh, and that's what we're seeing these days. Well, that's what you have to have in the military. That, that's what you if you want to survive. No, I mean that's, that's what, you what we're seeing with police these days. I think you're seeing it in some cases. I think uh, I, I still think the vast majority are are, are, are doing a, a good job. I think that there's a lot of assholes that are doing bad jobs. <laughs> I'm I'm not even yeah. I'm not even speaking to that at all. But what I am speaking to is more the culture. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, more the culture of um, the thin blue line. The culture yeah, of if me. you're not with us, no, you're with against you. us. I'm with you. I, I, of, I, I'm, yeah, he did something wrong, but he's our brother in blue. Yeah, and we've got to defend him. There's a problem with that, and that is. And that is very much an us versus them mentality. A that is a nature. wartime mentality. Yeah. And it's dangerous and it's damaging and has been damaging us for a while. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the, whenever you've got uh, whenever you've got police officers that are existing in a, uh, a situation that is similar to combat, you're going to have that. And you can mm -hmm. say that we don't have that. But we you know, we we've had police op we had a police officer shot in Houston a year or so ago uh, while pumping gas in his car, just shot. You know, uh, the, this this kind of thing happens, and that puts you in that that mentality. Mm -hmm. And it's human nature to draw that line. We have to fight against it. Yeah, well, and, and that's interesting, something I hadn't thought about, but I, I think it's probably true that the war on drugs has not only polarized the police against the people, but probably in some ways responsible to, you know, for instance, that shooting in Dallas that you mentioned. Yeah. You know, would that have ever happened if there wasn't a war on, Yeah. you know, if that war on mentality, frontline mentality... Uh, hadn't had never been developed. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. I think it's. A, I think it. I think declaring war on something that's not a nation is stupid. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, so uh, it seems it seems bizarre to me. Interesting. You can't declare war on an idea. Well, and, and, and another interesting point there. Uh, you know, we, we I talked earlier in kind of like high. Uh, 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 example terms of like, well, what if the, the military gives all their equipment and everything to this other group and says, we can't go in, you go in. But, you know, I hadn't thought about it before, but that's really what happened with the war on drugs. The, na the nation gave edict down to the police, gave them a bunch of equipment, a bunch yeah. of training and said, go. not a bunch of training, though. 
Well, well, no, they do quite a bit of training. Not not enough. Yeah, yeah, not n- not, not 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 nearly as much training as the military itself. As the people gets. who use that, uh, I think they're getting. I think they're getting plenty of weapons training. I don't think they're getting plenty of of uh, appropriate law training. When to use the weapons? Fine, I'll give uh, you that. Uh, you know, but they seem to be they seem to be pretty pretty adequate with their weapons. Uh, yeah. So they I, figured out point point bang bang. Yeah, that, that's harder than you think. Well, it is. and that point point is is. <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, I get I, that. I, I'm, I, that is difficult. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not. That, that pointing that part's a really interesting thing. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and put it up on the screen now. But there is a, a, a famous photo coming out of uh, of uh, Missouri. Um, Ferguson, Ferguson, Missouri, where the the police are walking through the street after declaring martial law and pointing their guns at a civilian with his hands up. That that became a poster child. But even beyond that, I, I know that was kind of like this real polarizing image uh, at the first peaceful protest that that occurred, where the cops were highly criticizing their response. One of the people that was up there was they put a sniper on the roof, aiming a gun at protesters. And uh, one of the things I've seen is in interviews with military people, they say that is ridiculous. We were trained you don't point your gun until you're ready to kill something. That's and right. they are marching down the street and pointing their gun as a de facto position. That's right. Oh, yeah. I think it was Ferguson that I was watching as well whenever um, there was a group of like four officers walking down the street. And three of them were in front and there was one behind. Just like he had his rifle up to his shoulder and is just fucking kind of scanning the area, pointing it yeah. at what appeared to be kind of a park area. But they were just, they were walking down the street and he was like ready to go. Yeah, we never did that. You, yeah. you're, you're, you were always, you were at the ready, but you were always down. You, yeah. You, you, you didn't, no, that, this was like that, parallel to the and, ground. And, and, and that is not military. That is not military style because you wouldn't have seen the military sniper. Well, and, and <laughs> I, I promise if, if the, the protesters would have oh. showed up with some militia group and a responding kind said, no, no, no. We're not attacking you. We just we, we need to make sure you're not here to hurt us. Yeah, it would have been all kinds of just. It would have been a fucking to, massacre. To rain down yeah. hell on absolutely. those absolutely absolutely those protesters. Would anyway, been, would have been Kent State all over again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. It would have been awful. Are we gonna talk about this beer before I, we drink it all? I, I, I think it, I think it is that time. Uh, you want to go first? Uh, yeah, yes. So, uh, what are we drinking, John? We are drinking uh, Oceans Between Us. Actually, you mind if I take it? Go ahead. I go first. Okay, we're drinking Oceans Between Us by Great Raft. Uh, it is out of Shreveport, Louisiana, and is a 7% ABV. Uh, and the reason I want to start is there's something worth mentioning that I read on the bottle that kind of changes my rating, and I think it's worth all of us kind of being on the same page about. This is an interesting marriage between a sour and an IPA. Yeah. Now, they don't call it a sour on the bottle, but but they do say um, uh, an ever-changing exploration of funk and hops. Yeah. Um, and... You know, it's it's interesting to me because this isn't a bad beer. It's actually a really interesting beer. Um, but when I first was kind of thinking of it as an IPA, I thought, man, there's this is not an IPA. But after seeing that it's a it's a funky IPA, now the the beer starts to make more sense to me. Uh, that said, this is not going to be my go-to. I'm probably not going to drink it again unless it's you know at a party or something. Uh, I think it's way overpriced for for how good it is. But I'm really glad we got it because it's something we haven't seen before. It's it, 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 it's a new take on beer that, that I've not been exposed to before. And for that reason, I would recommend for any of, of our beeries out there to go out and, and try it once, yeah, you yeah, know. No. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to knock it below an average beer. I, th- I think it, it rises above that. I'm going to go with 2.8. 2.8. All right. Um, I, I was really... Uh, Struggled with this one because mm-hmm. at the first sip I didn't like it at all. Yeah, but it didn't. It's not that it wasn't good. It's that it wasn't what I was expecting. <laughs> I was expecting something a little hoppier in there, knowing that it was an IPA and, and double dry hopped. Yeah, uh, and and the hops are not that they're not just in your face. Uh, you can taste them there, uh, but I like the funk on it. I do like the funk. There's it's got a, it's got a, got a, just a little bit of a sour in there that that I think is good. If I'm going to hit this beer, it's going to be that, that that it's a it's a beer that I've enjoyed, but I think I would enjoy one of these. I I think a second one is too much. It's just uh, it, yeah. This it, is going to be a beer that I want when I am sampling a bunch of different beers. Yeah, it'd be good on a flight. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just it's not a it, it's not a a beer that you just sit and drink. Uh, it's an experience. It is, and it's a it's a different kind of beer than I've ever had before. It's got a. a it tastes like a wedding to me. Does that make any sense at all? Like something? Not really. Well, it, tastes, it, 
it, it's got that it's got that wedding punch flavor to it that I just like like there that, that that's yeah there. if it was a bit sweeter yeah. I could see that yeah, I, it's okay. got a little bit of that to it and and I could see this being served at a situation like that uh, you know where you're gonna have if you don't want them to drink a whole lot but you want them to enjoy <laughs> themselves this is a good one um, I, I'm with you John I'm gonna go I, I think it meets the benchmark I probably wouldn't buy it again unless I was. Uh, you know, if I had a friend that I knew was really into beer, hey, you got to try this. Mm-hmm. I, I would do that. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go two six. All right. Um, so I'll go ahead and say, I'm going to give it a three. Um, I think that it is well hopped without being overpowering. Um, the funkiness is there. I would not by any means call this an introduction to a sour. Oh, no. Um, I think that... There's there's too much going on in this beer for that to be the case. It's kind of its own thing. But I, I would say that maybe somebody who has tried a few sours, um, give it a shot. And I think they would probably, if they don't enjoy the beer as itself, I think would enjoy the experience. Um, but I do think that it is well made. I really liked it. I'm nearly done with uh, with what I got from the first bottle. Um, so, yeah, it gets a three from me. So a three, a two, six, and a two, eight. Yeah. Yes. And so yeah, it, we're all in the same ballpark on this one. You know, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's a pretty good beer for what it, for what it is. Let's play our game. Um, this is only going to get you laid if you are trying to bed somebody who really likes beer and you happen to leave the price tag on it. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> I, I would also say, like, and, and this is going to play right into my date rating, but not only leave the price tag on it, but I think they have to be into beer, and it's like, I got something you've never seen yeah. before. And they're like, <laughs> really? And you're like, yeah, exactly. oh, yeah. Yeah, you know? you've got to, like, you've got to kind of hype it up, I think. Yeah. It, this isn't just something that you pull out, and you're like, here, let me pour you a beer. You pull it out, you go, you got to check this out, and you kind of show them the bottle so they can kind of get a feel for it. It's, a, it's an a, ugly bottle. Fine. Um, I think what we're saying here is a drinker, not a shower. Yeah. yeah. But um, <laughs> never, mind, never mind. It doesn't matter. But um, but I think you kind of you make sure that they're aware that it is made with a hundred percent Britannomyces. Um, I think you make sure that they know that it's double dry hopped. I don't even um, know what a Britannomyces is. That's the it, yeast that's used yeah, in it. Okay. It, it, yeah. Well, it's not a yeast. It's, it's a bacteria. I'm pretty sure. Um, but you make sure that they're aware that it is a sour beer, um, and, and it's an IPA, so it's going to be something a little different than what they've heard, yeah, John. Yeah. Cool. Cool. What do you, what do you think, Genus John? of yeast in the family, uh, Saccharomyces tastes, I can't even say that. It's yeast. Uh, yeah. I stand corrected. It is. Um, but anyway, so I think there's... God was wrong. I think there's a little bit of showmanship that has to go into this, but if you do it... Um, you can impress somebody who is um, a, a serious beer drinker, really likes craft beer. Um, but yeah, it, it's your gonna basic have... bitch is not going to like this though. No, oh no, yeah, absolutely not. Yeah, some rando you pick up at the bar is not like this. <laughs> so, so as far as dates go, uh, I, I, you know, I'm agreeing with you guys, and I'm, I'm going to put it as a mix it up beer. Uh, you know, this may be a great third date beer. You know, you've you've gotten to know each other a little bit, and you wanna you wanna try something new. It's also great for well deep in the pack. You know, when you have a, a long relationship. But uh, I'm not going to bank on this one. I'm not going to try and introduce somebody with this one. This is when you want to try something new. I would put this at my. Uh, I took the girl to the beach, and we're going to make a, uh, a a moonlight walk down the beach. I'm going to pop this, and we're going to drink it while we're walking down the beach. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Because it's because it's, it's memorable. Yeah, it is. You'll always remember that. I, I, so, make sure uh, she smells it. She'll remember that for the rest of her yeah. life. Uh, so uh, we get we, we did fuck. We did let date lawnmower. Not a lawnmower beer. Uh, no. Uh, although you know, in the heat of the summer, I think it would be refreshing. I just it's too yeah. expensive for a lawnmower beer. And mm-hmm. You can't drink twelve of them. So uh, yeah, I have a big lawn. So yeah, this this wouldn't even be um, economical for my lawn, <laughs> <laughs> and I've got a smallish lawn. Uh. All right, so back to our regularly scheduled program, John. Where are we? So uh, I had a few more things, and I think these are going to go a little bit faster than our previous ones do. Uh, first one I want to I want to think about and talk about real quick. Whatever you're putting on that either either the camo or the totally black uniform, that SWAT type the body gear, armor. Yeah, 
how does that affect the mentality of the wearer is the first oh, thing I want to talk oh, about. Oh, yeah, yeah, completely different. Uh, y- you know, it, I can remember as, as, as soon as we put the flak jackets and the helmets on, uh, to, to, you know, even if it was a training op, we were immediately pissed off and wanted to destroy something. Because you got yourself into that mentality. You're Rambo uh, all of a sudden. You're Rambo. You're, you're, you're Rambo all of a sudden. Uh, and it's not any different than everything else. Think about it, John. Whenever, uh, whenever you put your your tie and your sports coat on, you're ready to you're ready to do yeah. uh, to, you know, to, to give a speech and do something political. Yeah. Uh, there's something. There, dressing the part changes yeah. you. It does. Uh, which is why back in our civil asset forfeiture, I was so pissed off about the cops in Tinnahaw wearing a, uh, you know, jump boots and and utilities. Yeah. I didn't call them camis this time. No, like you that. didn't. That was good. You have any anything else to add to that, or okay? Uh, and and you know, kind of on the other side of that same coin, I want to talk about how does that affect the response of people who are see who are being addressed by that? I mean, you know, you're sitting there in your car, you're getting pulled over. Let's talk about Tenaha real quick. And somebody yeah. comes up to to your your car in full military gear, gear with an assault rifle, like terrified. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I think you know, honestly, it it quite often. Uh, provokes the justification for their response. You know, yeah. you're 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 laying in bed. All of a sudden, a flashbang goes off, and a bunch of guys in black run through your house with guns. What are you going to do? You're going to yeah. grab a gun and shoot. You yeah. you don't know what the yeah. hell's going sure. on. Absolutely. And then and then they get to say, well, he shot at us. I, you know, we were just yeah. walking around. We were just peacefully dropping flashbangs in his living room. Well, yeah. and the thing about it is, um, most civilians don't have interaction with the SWAT team. Sure. And if if the police bust into your house, that's a, a uniform that you're familiar with. Yeah. Um, when you start seeing these people in like full military getup, um, you don't think that it is the cops that are coming into your house. Yeah. You don't know what to fucking think, um, considering that you are in the U.S. in a seemingly peaceful place, um, and all of a sudden you've got fucking military people running through your house, throwing flash, uh, flash grenades and, and screaming at you. And, you know, one of the things that I saw justified by some of the officers is like, they should know that we're with SWAT. We're running in, we're yelling that we're there for a search warrant. We're yelling at them to get on the ground, but I've, I haven't been in a SWAT situation before, but I've been in a police situation where multiple officers or are yelling orders at you. And when more than one person is yelling at a time you have no idea and, and you're in a really fucking foreign and terrifying situation, and they've got guns. you don't know. And yes. And they're pointing their guns at you. You don't know what the fuck to do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be as extreme as a military uniform. I can think about the difference in how I feel if I'm pulled over by a city cop versus a state trooper with a smoky bear drill instructor style hat. Yeah. There's a different mentality there. There is. Uh, and, and, that's, that's, and that's just a small difference. Right. But, you know, I'm, I'm more likely to, to, to be nervous around the, the smoky bear than I mm-hmm. am about around the, you know, the blue uniform. So, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The other thing, and we, we've kind of touched on this throughout the show, but I want to see if there's anything we missed. Um, one of the big criticisms of, of these units and, and this militarization is they're getting all this equipment, but they're not being trained correctly on how to use it. And not just in how to, you know, pull the bank switch, but how to actually interact when with people. When to implement it and how yeah. to implement it. Yeah. 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 It's, not, it's not that they don't, str- don't, don't know how to, how to use it technically. They don't know how to use it strategically. Yeah. 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 I mean, one of the... One of the stats that I saw was that 85 to 90 percent of the times that a SWAT unit is deployed is for a search warrant. Yeah. Um, and and usually um, is for drug enforcement. Have you have y'all ever seen that terrible show that Steven Seagal Steven Seagal Lawman I think it was called. Uh, he was a. I've heard of it. I've not yeah, seen I, it. I, 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 I'm sitting here I, I, shaking my head like anybody on the podcast can hear that. I watched no, one I where, uh, where 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 he, he took an armored personnel carrier through the front gate of a place, uh, killed the dog in the process, got sued over it. By the way, lost his show, but he uh, uh, and it was it, it was to to do a search warrant, it was yeah, for a search warrant. You know, oh, uh, yeah. now that was a TV show, but you know it was a it was a reality TV show. Yeah. So, yeah. I just I just wonder how many times that kind of thing happens. Well, and, you know. This this is what leads to Ruby Ridge. This is what leads mm-hmm. to Waco. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, well, that's one of the things that that a lot of these um, these 
officers and, and even some departments that are speaking out against the militarization, they're saying, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is that the military is literally just giving this equipment to police departments. Yeah. Um, it's it's incredibly easy to get. And, and a lot of times you get more than you ever could need. Yeah. Um, and they said, one of the things that you're seeing is they've got all these brand new toys yeah. of a sort. And they're in a, a small, peaceful town of 10,000 people. But... By God, they want to use their fucking yeah, toys, yeah. and so you I end up seeing them. Kids. Yeah, you yeah. end up seeing them implemented in ways that they absolutely shouldn't be. Back in the eighties, only about twenty. Okay, so we started off earlier, and um, SWAT teams were established in the sixties. Uh, yeah, sixties, seventies. Are Late you about 60s. to talk about numbers and escalation of use? Yeah. Uh, let's let's talk about that later. All right. Yeah. The. Uh, uh, but but the early SWAT teams were you know they were in your big cities they they, mm-hmm. they were there, and now while they're not SWAT teams we have we have you know armed personnel carriers in mm-hmm. Tyler Texas here we don't have one in Jacksonville I don't think we do had we? one if we they don't, don't have it anymore yeah, uh, they've done something with it yeah. it looks like a converted uh, ambulance looks like a converted ambulance okay well we uh you know, you, you see these these things being used in in small towns it's it's uh, a little bit terrifying. You know, you, you talked about that new toy. I always tell the kids when I talk about the military buildup in the Cold War, I always say, you know, remember at Christmas morning when you get a new toy, what's the first thing you want to do? You want to go play with it. Yeah. Uh, my, my wife was kind enough. She gives me a new gun most years at Christmas. And the first thing I do is I want to go kill something with it. Well, you know, <laughs> think about when a town gets a tank or, or an APC, you know, they're, they're going to want to use it. I know this drug dealer. This would be great for his house. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So the other thing I want to talk about, and and one that I, I've I've really tried to stay away from in this, so it's, it's crept in a few times. <coughs> the thing that kind of brought this to the forefront front in the uh, American dialogue uh, was actually uh, Ferguson, Missouri, and I really hate that because evidence has come back and and kind of largely exonerated the actions of the cop in respect to Michael Brown. And that kind of seems to have overshadowed the greater story about what happened in that community and the the larger response there. What has been happening in Ferguson, Missouri, for decades? Yeah. So with that said, I, I want to. I don't want to talk about the Michael Brown incident, but I want to talk about the response largely to that. We've touched a little bit, but I don't think many people remember that in that town. Whenever the protests started, and largely peaceful protests, there was some looting, but the protests that were exactly targeted in this uh, were largely peaceful protests, they instated martial law in a yeah. town in Missouri yeah. and started running around in riot gear. There was a guy in that same town who, uh, around that same time period, was pulled over and arrested. Now, it's later going to come out that he was they had the wrong guy. He was not guilty. They take him back to the police station, and uh, in that police station, the cameras end up not working. So they don't have video evidence of this on either side, Um, and they beat the guy. Now, whether it was justified or not, I mean, is is up in the air, but he gets exonerated of everything, but gets charged with one crime. Do you know that crime Resisting arrest? No. Destruction of public property for bleeding on the uniform of the cops beating him. Really? Yeah. Oh. Um, and and uh, another point on that that, that I, I think is egregious in, in many towns. Now, this is changing. This is actually one where we can see some real change coming about, uh, largely due to uh, policies instated by the Obama administration. Um, but they were getting this large amount of military equipment uh, for engagement with citizens, yet couldn't find the funds and or care. And in fact, in Ferguson, Missouri, they had it. They just refused to use it to put cameras on these police officers. They can't figure out how to get cameras on yeah. or even get cameras working in the prisons. Yeah. But they can manage to get tanks. Yeah. You know, and and so uh, you know, what do you think? I mean, putting the Michael Brown stuff aside, what do you think about how that whole incident developed in the town? Uh, okay. I I'm I'm going to I'm going to kind of come to the, the police officers defense a little bit here because Part of the lesson that they got is the lessons learned from Watts, and later on, probably much more recently, was definitely more recently, was the uh, uh, L.A. riots after the um, Rodney King, mm-hmm. 
where they were burning the city to the ground. I mean, they were they were they were pulling police officers out of cars. They pulled a, a, a guy that was taking an eighteen. They yanked him out of a car and beat him. Mm-hmm. This kind of stuff was happening, and the lesson was if we. Because L.A. was slow to, to interact. The cops were very slow to, 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 to react to that stuff. And they were brutalized for it. How could you let this happen when you had these police? Why weren't they doing something? Um, later on in, in, uh, in Katrina, the Bush administration was brutalized for waiting so long to, to send in troops because the governor wouldn't ask for it. Mm-hmm. Then they sent them in. They were brutalized for sending them in, sending them in with this stuff. The, the lesson the police officers, I think, learned was – was, was that you have to act. You can't wait. Now, it, it, it's better to act and apologize than it is to wait and act. Um, now, I, I said I'm kind of coming to their defense because I, I don't think they're right. I think they're wrong in what they did, but I understand why they did it, mm-hmm. okay? Uh, they're in a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. If they don't use the SWAT, people are going to say, look, why, did, why do we have all this? Why do we have all, have all these weapons? Why are we training you if you're not going to use it? If they do use it, it's, my God, you're, you're uh, jackbooted thugs. This is the Gestapo, and you're killing citizens. Yeah. They're in a no-win situation with this. Um, and I, I at least want to make sure that we're aware of that. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Do you have any anything to add, Anna? Um, not on that specifically. I was going to take another direction. Okay. Um, well, the, the last thing we're going to talk about is is how it's increasing and, and the stats around it. Uh, do you want to put it in there before we, we sure. move on to that? Um, so, Mike, you mentioned that they're in a no-win situation. Um, and, and what that actually reminds me of, and because I think that there's a solution. And it reminds me of the Dallas police chief coming out after the guy who was um, shooting at the cops downtown. The one where they used the, the drone bot? Yeah. 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 Um, and he came out and he said, I'm, I'm pretty sure that was when he started talking about that. I'm pretty sure. But he came out and he said, one of the biggest issues that we're seeing right now is that cops are seen as being responsible for taking care of all of society's ills. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we have so many laws at this point that cops are expected to enforce um, that they are put into a no-win situation. And I think a big part of the solution here is, and I guess I'm going to get on my political thing now, but is getting rid of victimless crimes. Because I think one of the ways that um, SWAT is able to be misused um, is because we do have so many victimless victimless crimes on the books. Yeah. Um, and it's their job to enforce it. It is their job to enforce it. And you can go in and you can do a, a drug gun. raid. It doesn't. Um, but they've they've demonized anybody who uses any sort of drugs to such a degree that they can justify it in their minds. Um, and so I think if you get rid of that and it's not their job to um, to enforce these these laws that have no victim when they're broken, um, then perhaps we can see police in fewer no-win situations um, when they are truly only expected to enforce laws in which individuals or groups of people are actually harmed. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Interesting. So there was my soapbox. Now All let's right. talk about that thing. I'm with so- you on victimless crimes, by the way. So I, I want to talk about how this has kind of evolved over time. You know, the, the section here I have is, is this increasing? And while I'll go ahead and, and answer the first question, of is this increasing? So um, in the, the 70s, when this first, uh, uh, five to 10 years after this first started coming out, we were seeing about 300-ish per year uh, utilizations of SWAT. Um, in the 80s, this is going to increase to 3,000 per year. In 2005... In the whole U.S. Uh, yes. In 2005, this number has gone up to 50,000 per year. Wow. And in 2013, we're all the way up to 70,000 uses per year. So that is the scale of increase on, on the... And, and, and about a dozen of those are people swatting in, on, on, on Twitch with video games. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, That's and you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting to me because the, the response there, I don't know that they're completely... In fact, I, I think they're not completely wrong... 
uh, is to blame the people calling this in. Yeah. To blame the people calling calling in, and and then the 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 Twitch streamer who gets killed over yeah. this thing, and then they're going to try them with murder. I completely understand that. Good, throw the book at him. However, it was the culture of the police militarization that made that such a dangerous and useful tactic. To what begin happened with. to due diligence? What happened to knowing that that, that there's something there before you go in? Call yeah. them in for a victimless crime. Investigations, investigations. Well, I think this is really interesting because one of the things. So I had a college buddy. Uh, who was out of the military and going on his uh, um, uh, what do they call the the way the the military pays for college? It's the GI Bill. The That's GI Bill, uh, using his GI Bill and going through college. And one of the things that he said was a big problem in I think Afghanistan, one of those Middle Eastern countries we bomb regularly, um, but was that they would get really bad information because. There'd be these two families, and one would owe oh, yeah, one yeah. money, and they would go in and say, oh, yeah, yeah, there's terrorists over there. They're just trying to pay them back. And it's really interesting for me to see the parallels of what's happening yeah. in, in on our own soil yeah, when you militarize the police. I read an article about how uh, 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 different gangs, street gangs and, and, and drug organizations would call in and report other drug organizations in order to cut out their, their competition. Oh, yeah. 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 So, you know, it's, it's, you know, you're using them as a, are, are you a tool of law enforcement at that point or are you a tool of the cartel? Right. right. You know? Right. So why do we think that, that what's causing this, this, this super fast drive upward in the usage of these swans? I, I, I think it's a. War is never intended to end and driven inward. I think it's technology. I think I it's think the, there's I, part I, of it. I think it's the fact. We always, as we introduce a technology, that technology becomes more abundant and more accepted and more used. And we have introduced military technology to the police force, and the natural progression is we're going to use it more. Okay. Um, so, you know. And I think that that is driven and justified by wars. In the language never, of war. Yeah. It never intended to end because you are fighting ideas, ideas that don't die, instead of specific dangerous enemies yeah. yeah we're not fighting it's not a war against the cartel is a war against yeah. drugs yeah 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 um, um and and turned inward we're not fighting the cartels that are pushing drugs across the border we're not fighting uh terrorist cells i mean we are but um our our domestic military i suppose you could call it is specifically being directed to look for homegrown terrorists yeah. to uh, target the meth dealer in the shady part of town. Yeah, the DEA. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I want to kind of sh shift for one last thing. Just it, 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 It's tangentially related, but it's timely. Is it a, Do you think it's a violation of posse comitatus that the president has now sent five battalions of Marines to the uh, the southern border of the United States to, 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 to string Constantino wire to try and prevent this uh, uh, refugee train. I'm, I'm just curious as to what, what we think about that. Uh, no. no, I don't. I, I think it's over response. I, I, I think it's unwarranted, unjustified. Uh, yeah. I, I, I look at it um, in, in much the same way I would look at you know, uh, there's some, you know, little squab squabble over what part of the Gaza Strip belongs to who. And we go in and, 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 and fucking, you know, dust the place, turn it into, into a glass manufacturing facility. Um, and you, because we took one side or the other. I think it's an over response. I think it's unnecessary and it's not our business. Uh, this one, a little bit different. It's a little bit our business, but not, not warrant in that. But posse comitatus, I don't know. I think it's a no. violation of posse comitatus unless the president declares it an invasion. I mean, he's... And, and I think that well, that's... We need, a formal, you need, we need a formal declaration. Well, and you know, so off, that's become a really blurry place. I but mean, border so, enforcement is the federal government's job. Yes, but it's not the military's job, unless there's an invasion. Fine, but, but I, 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 it's border I, patrol's job. But they're not sending in the federal. They're not sending in the federal military. They sent to, in five battalions of Marines to uh, take the place of local law enforcement. They're not under local law enforcement, and they're not taking the place of local law enforcement. No, and they're not being used against. The against people, the people, except they're, it's private property that they're running the, 
wire on. But, yeah, yeah, and that would be the most questionable part to me yeah. Yeah. of whether or not it was I a violation. Know. I was just curious because it, it it's like the tangentially I'd related. I'd love to say it was, we, but I don't think it is. Since we talked about I think it is. I, 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 and, and again, just because I, I think the military's job is to go against invasions and mm -hmm. I think you could make the question. Well, the, and I think that the, they can argue that they are protecting the border from invasion. Yeah, okay, but I, I just, I go back to my belief that it shouldn't be used unless there's a declaration of war. So, well, so, so, me too. Yeah, well, yeah. and, and, okay, declaration of invasion, declaration of war are different. One requires Congress and, and the yeah, other. Yeah, yeah. You're well, right. and but, I, I, but I think we're at a really interesting place with, within our history because official declarations are becoming a really blurry thing. Which is a problem. But yeah. we're starting to see things like Twitter and, and rallies oh being used in this oh kind God. of manner. Anyway, yeah. I just wanted to, I, I wanted to throw that out there anyway. Uh, I can't wait till our next president when he starts using Instagram for his official declarations. That's Snapchat. When it, yeah, Snapchat. <laughs> Snapchat declarations. <laughs> Oh there'll, be, there'll be something else by then. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Oh, good God! I'm waiting. I'm, I'm waiting for for President Trump to come out on like you porn with something. You done? <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna end on you porn. Actually, we're not. We're gonna end on a correction. During our civil asset forfeiture show, uh, we were the recent one where we were revisiting it. You um, made a mistake. I made a mistake. Um, Go yeah, ahead and take I, credit for that. There, I, I, I'd say I'd say we we did because nobody, no, nobody, everybody went along with it. So anyway, um, I ranted a bit on uh, Trump threatening the life and career of a Texas Congre uh, Texas state senator um, who had filed a bill f um, regarding civil asset forfeiture. Uh, her name was Connie Burton. I don't remember if I mentioned that in the show or not, but I did attribute that bill to a Democrat, not a Republican. Mm -hmm. She is a Republican. I apologize. Um, and so that is corrected now. Um, one of the things that our commenter did point out is that while it was filed by a Republican, it does have bipartisan support, yep. um, which is a very important thing, I think, to before I just go ranting on civil asset forfeiture again, is something worth recognizing is that when these are filed, they do tend to have bipartisan support, yep. uh, even if it's not enough to pass. But so there's that correction. Thank you so much to, damn it, I didn't look up the name of the person who, uh, who made that correction. That's okay. But anyway. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It, it was an organization, not a person. What? Yeah, the, 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 the commenting channel was. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay. No, irregardless, it's a uh, irregardless we, or regardless. We, oh, Cobra Podca uh, Broadcast TV channel. Thank we, you. We we did want to correct ourselves because we you know we make mistakes, but we want to be right. Yes. Uh, so anyway, um, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, if you like this show, be sure to like, subscribe, share, heart, whatever the means is to show that you enjoyed it on the place where you're listening or watching it. Um, don't forget to hit us up on social media by searching six pack philosophy. Check out our swag on teespring at teespring.com slash stores slash six pack philosophy. All yeah, spelled out. Mouthful. It is. Um, and hit up our website for all sorts of cool content. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We've had fun and we hope you have too. Cheers. 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 Six Pack Philosophy is supported by independent philosophers just like you. If you would like to support us, go to sixpackphilosophy.com and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.